Okay, now, Mark is going to talk about things. Uh, I'm not going to talk about things un until we get to the Q&A stuff. Uh, I'm just going to read you a passage. Uh, I, I, I wrote two... I wrote two utopias. Uh, one of them is overtly anarchist. That's the dispossessed. It's the first, and so far as I know, the only anarchist utopia. Uh, then, uh, some years later, being kind of uncomfortable with the, uh, the utopia that kind of is like a blueprint for what the future should be, you know, and so on. I wrote this book called Always Coming Home, which is a real mess. <laughs> and I think is more deeply anarchist than the dispossessed, right? But uh, a lot of people I just think I was being primitivist and thinking we should go back to living with nature and, you know, uh, <laughs> stuff. But uh, actually, uh, it's, it's more subversive than, than the other one. But uh, the people who write books about books mostly haven't sort of seen that. But it's really hard to read bits out of because all the bits are, are interconnected with all the other bits. So, um, and not wanting to, to take too long tonight, I'm just going to read you one piece from The Dispossessed. And uh, Margaret asked me to, uh, to read a bit where, that showed where the, the protagonist, Shebek, was was kind of at odds with it, with his own uh, his own people, his own ideology. But uh, I'm not doing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, uh, this is uh, this comes actually quite late in the book, and it's it's uh, the the part in the book where he perhaps he most clearly perceives what what he's been doing. Uh, if you don't know the book, he, he's a, a physicist uh, who's grown up in this uh, uh, anarchist uh, world uh, where things were not going altogether well and people were beginning to act really kind of like uh, capitalists and things. Uh, so he, he goes to the, uh, the neighboring world, uh, the sort of parent world, and uh, things aren't going too well there either, and he gets into the revolution. Uh, so the poor guy's been kind of tossed back and forth between uh, the ideals of his society and the realities of human nature and stuff. So here he is towards the end of the book with his wife, Takver. Long after Takver had fallen asleep that night, he lay awake, his hands under his head, looking into darkness, hearing silence. He thought of his long trip out of the dust remembering the levels and mirages of the desert, the train driver with the bold brown head and candid eyes who had said that one must work with the time and not against it. Shevik had learned something about his own will these last four years. In its frustration, he had learned its strength. No social or ethical imperative equaled it. Not even hunger could repress it. The less he had the more absolute became his need to be. He recognized that need in Odonian terms as his cellular function, the analogic term for the individual's individuality, the work he can do best, therefore his best contribution to his society. A healthy society would let him exercise that optimum function freely in the coordination of all such functions, finding its adaptability and strength. That was a central idea of Odo's analogy. It was kind of the founding book of his culture. That the Odonian society on Anaris had fallen short of the ideal didn't, in his eyes, lessen his responsibility to it. Just the contrary. With the myth of the state out of the way, the real mutuality and reciprocity of society and individual became clear. Sacrifice might be demanded of the individual, but never compromise. 
For though only the society could give security and stability, only the individual, the person, had the power of moral choice, the power of change, the essential function of life, that the Odonian society was conceived as a permanent <coughs> revolution, and revolution begins in the thinking mind. All this Shevek had thought out in these terms, for his conscience was a completely Odonian one. He was therefore certain by now that his radical and unqualified will to create was, in Odonian terms, its own justification. His sense of primary responsibility towards his work did not cut him off from his fellows, from his society, as he thought. It engaged him with them absolutely. Um, footnote here. Um, I'm talking about a scientist, a physicist, but of course I'm also talking about artists or anybody with a job to do that they know is their job. That was nice. He also felt that a man who had this sense of responsibility about one thing was obliged to carry it through in all things. It was a mistake to see himself as its vehicle and nothing else, to sacrifice any other obligation to it. That sacrificiality was what Takver had spoken of, recognizing in herself when she was pregnant. She'd spoken with a degree of horror, of self-disgust, because she too was an Odonian and the separation of means and ends was to her too false. For her, as for him, there was no end. There was process. Process was all. You could go in a promising direction, or you could go wrong, but you didn't set out with the expectation of ever stopping anywhere. All responsibilities, all commitments thus understood, took on substance and duration. So his mutual commitment with Takvir, their relationship, had remained thoroughly alive during their four years separation. They had both suffered from it and suffered a good deal, but it had not occurred to either of them to escape the suffering by denying the commitment. For, after all, he thought now, lying in the warmth of Takvir's sleep, it was joy they were both after, the completeness of being. If you evade suffering, you also evade the chance of joy. <clears throat> pleasure you may get, or pleasures, but you will not be fulfilled. You will not know what it is to come home 